Hello and welcome to the Epilogue with Sile Bolami. On today's show, we're speaking about retrenchments, something that's a growing concern for South Africans as the unemployment rate continues to increase and more and more South Africans are concerned about their job security. Joining me on today's show is Humuto Mugwena, who is an attorney and a law lecturer. Humuto, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, what is retrenchment? So retrenchment in legal terms is also called dismissal for operational requirements. Mm. We call it a no-fault dismissal, which means it's not the employee's fault. And it relates to dismissing an employee or a number of employees for economic, technical, structural, or similar needs. That's actually the definition out of the Labor Relations Act. So in essence, it amounts to a dismissal that relates to a business changing or shifting and having specific economic or structural or technological needs mm -hmm. that it needs to meet. And as a result, those particular employees don't fit in to where the employer is trying to take the organization. So what would the difference between that and a mutual separation agreement be? A mutual separation agreement might be for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. It might be a, a, an ill fit in relation to culture. There might be disciplinary issues that bring or, or, or give rise to the, to the mutual separation agreement. Mm -hmm. um, retrenchments can sometimes be voluntary. Mm -hmm. That can be part of a retrenchment process where the employer offers employees voluntary retrenchment packages. Mm -hmm. But it is quite different from a mutual separation agreement because a mutual separation agreement might have uh, come about through any number of reasons. Okay. And so what influences the decisions that organizations take about which employees are going to be retrenched? Is it performance-based, capability-based? What, what are the considerations? So it depends on why the employer is retrenching, I would say. So for example, if the reason for retrenchment relates to economic needs, uh, they would want to save money. So mm -hmm. employers, employees that cost the company a lot of money mm -hmm. um, but maybe don't bring in that same amount of revenue might be considered. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, during a consultation process of retrenchment, the selection criteria for employees needs to be something that they agree on, employees and employer agree on together. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, example of a selection criteria is what we call LIFO last in, first out. Okay. So the newest employees might be selected first to okay. be retrenched, as opposed to people who've been there for 10 or 15 years. Mm. So selection criteria might, might vary. And what is the correct process for following through in a, the retrenchment process? It is detailed, but I'll try and be brief. In Section 189, there is, and also the Code of Good Practice, that's also part of the LRA, mm -hmm. um, it details exactly what is required from an employer in relation to a retrenchment. And the first thing that needs to happen is that if, if an employer is contemplating or considering retrenchment, mm -hmm. they need to issue the employees with a Section 189 letter mm -hmm. in contemplation. So often what happens, unfortunately, is that you'll get employers sometimes, they've long decided to retrench, right. and then they issue a contemplation letter. But the correct way that it's supposed to happen is that while the employer is considering retrenchment, they issue a letter to employees to say, we're thinking about it, mm. and invite employees to begin a consultation process with them. Mm. Now, the consultation process is aimed at reaching consensus on a number of different issues, things like how many employees will be retrenched, the mm. timing of the retrenchment, mm. What will the severance packages be? Um, who exactly are they considering retrenching and why? Mm. And that should kickstart a consultation process between employees or their representatives mm. and the employer. During the consultation process, this is when they're attempting to reach consensus. Mm. They do not have to reach consensus. The employer must attempt to reach consensus on okay. these issues, and then they come to a final decision. So what constitutes an unfair retrenchment? Uh, and any number of things could go wrong to mm -hmm. make a retrenchment possibly unfair. But for example, if the contemplation of, 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 of retrenchment is really a, a, a smokescreen, the employer mm -hmm. has long decided and the, all, and the consensus is not genuine. Mm -hmm. You know, employers might call employees to a meeting and just tell them this is what we're doing, as mm -hmm. opposed to reaching consensus. Um, so those are the kinds of things. It, 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 a number of different issues can make a retrenchment unfair, mm -hmm. but things where that relate to the employer not being genuine in their intention to reach consensus might render retrenchment unfair or the selection criteria not being fair. Mm. And in terms of retrenchment packages, what types of solutions or offers do employers generally kind of put on the table for employees? So the law only requires that an employee is paid one week for every completed year of service. 
that's okay. actually what the law requires. Mm. Often employers will try and go over and above that and provide the employees with more if mm. they can, or they will add things like training opportunities or assistance for the employees to be reemployed somewhere else to try and add to sort of the deal that they're giving mm. the employees. And you mentioned earlier that there are there is the option of voluntary uh, retrenchment uh, packages. Now, if you don't opt for a voluntary package and your employer ends up having to retrench you anyway, does that then kind of work against you in terms of the package that you end up with or your negotiating power? Not necessarily. The thing that would work against you in a, if, if you end up being retrenched was if your employer offered you employment. Okay. another job and you refuse it unreasonably your refusal doesn't make sense mm -hmm. then um you know you you might forfeit actually your right to a severance package because you've refused alternative employment mm -hmm. so voluntary retrenchment it's not something that you have to agree to mm -hmm. and it's not offered by all employers it's not something that is standard uh, in the law mm -hmm. so it's not something you necessarily have to agree to you can wait out the process Sometimes employers will ask to do that, will ask employees, do you like, would you like to volunteer to, to, to leave rather, because it makes the process a lot easier and it might save other jobs if there's people there who already want to leave mm. and who already have an idea, look, this is actually what I'm looking at doing next, let me rather leave now. Mm. But it's not sort of standard uh, as part of the retrenchment pro process. And there's a, a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of, obviously organizations at the moment that are looking at their finances and whether they have the, the capability to continue to employ as many people as they do. And the trend that we're seeing is a lot more organizations are asking people to apply, reapply for their positions that they currently have. Is that, uh, you know, kind of emerging as a new way to kind of try and reduce the friction that's associated with retrenchments? So often those are, are, are relating to structural retrenchments. Mm. So sometimes the business structure is changing, mm. and that's why people might say you need to reapply and we need to reconsider the qualifications that we need in a particular situation mm. um, and how much that's costing the business and how much revenue you're bringing in. So it's not, it might not form part of a retrenchment process even, mm. but it can be a way to avoid retrenchment, to place people accordingly, to okay. place people in the right positions that mm. will be most beneficial to the business and to the individuals. And then in terms of the settlement of retrenchment packages, is there stipulated guidelines in terms of what employee, employers are required to do? So is there a specific time frame that employees must have received their payments by? Or is it up to the employers to determine, you know, they can decide they want to pay you over 12 months or whatever the case may be? So it, it needs to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it cannot be a situation where, I mean, if you, if you are paying someone's retrenchment package over a 12-month period of time and it doesn't amount to a full salary, I mean, it, it doesn't become reasonable for the yeah. employee. For the most part, there will be a stipulated time frame, and it's something that they can reach consensus on. Mm -hmm. So if, if, I mean, we're in August now, if I want to retrench employees and say in October, mm -hmm. uh, the end of October will be your last day of work, um, by mid-November, I would have paid out this package, or by the end of October on your last day, I would have paid out the package. It needs right. to be reasonable. Right. Mm. So what recourse can employees take if an employer says, for instance, I'm going to pay you over a 12-month period after? You, you would have long lost your job already by then. Um, so what can people do if an employer comes in with kind of a hard hand around that? So an employee can take their unfair retrenchment or what they perceive to be their unfair retrenchment to the CCMA and dispute it. Mm -hmm. And they can dispute in relation to things like how they are being paid. Right. And, and, but in the end, retrenchment and the way that retrenchment is done, the final decision is with the employer. Mm -hmm. um, so the de employee would have to demonstrate or show some level of unfairness throughout the process to say something actually went wrong the consensus was not genuine mm. that the employer did with us. We spoke about the payments, for example, and the employer said they would pay this, but they didn't, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't, they didn't meet their end of the bargain. So it's not something that is, I, I can't give you a hard and fast principle. It's mm. something that relates to how the consensus was reached or mm. not reached and whether it was genuine. So what can employees do to challenge um, any unfair, what they feel is unfair retrenchment processes? So employees can go to the CCMA to try and question or dispute any unfairness that they deem may have happened during mm. the retrenchment process. They are allowed to do that. They can lodge a dispute within this, with the CCMA. Um, it would 
the unfairness would likely relate to the genuineness of the consensus or the genuineness of the consultation process. Oh, yeah. Did things happen properly and did the employees believe that the employer was genuinely trying to reach a solution or reach a consensus? That is where sometimes unfairness may arise. Um, if the selection criteria is maybe also unfair. Mm -hmm. In retrenchments where there are more than 50 employ employees being retrenched at a time, um, the CCMA may also appoint a facilitator to help the employer to go through the retrenchment process to mm -hmm. try and ensure that there is fairness from the start. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, can employers use liquidation as a means of kind of getting away from following through on recruitment? Um, retrenchment processes and agreements or consultations that they've had with staff? So what normally happens during a liquidation process, you, you'll need to retrench because the business is, is liquidating. Mm. And employees become creditors of the business. Mm -hmm. So during a normal liquidation process, when a company liquidates, it might have an X number of debts. Mm -hmm. Employees become people who have a claim against the employer. Mm -hmm. Now what that means sometimes, unfortunately, is that the employees might not get a full retrenchment or severance package that mm -hmm. they were entitled to they would have a portion of the estate of the business or the the whatever is left of the business they become creditors of the business mm -hmm. in essence so it can limit the employees uh, to an extent that they might not get everything that they would have normally gotten in the process mm -hmm. but they still form part of that process they still definitely form part of the liquidation process okay mm -hmm. well I definitely think that you know, this is a topic that requires so much more time. We don't have all of the time in the world. But thank you so much, Khamutza, for joining us today and for sharing all of this information, which I know is going to be helpful to a lot of people. And please do spend more time researching and understanding it, because with the way that things are going in this country, we just never know. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Epilogue with Sile Bolani. Don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and share this content with your network. We'll see you next time.